Um, so I'm going to start slowly making a start because we've got so many speakers um, this evening and I imagine loads and loads of questions about to come through as well. Um, so just to introduce myself, my name is Lou Robinson. I'm the Vice President Engagement at the OU Students Association, which probably means nothing. It's a very cloudy <laughs> name for a Vice President, but it basically means that I work a lot on student voice. So if you see anything to do with student consultations, student voice festival, I'm behind the scenes working on that. Also work on our Hoot online magazine and co-chair our environment and sustainability group, which is why I'm here this evening. I'm very, very excited um, to be introducing some fantastic speakers this evening as well. Um, just before we get started, I do have to put in front of you this lovely code of conduct. If you've joined a Freshers event already this week, then you'll be very familiar with this code of conduct. Um, it's fairly self-explanatory, can be accessed via our website somewhere as well, um, but it's just being respectful um, within the chat box um, with anything that you're posting um, and just making sure that this is a safe and comfortable place for all students. So. Basically, being respectful is a nice short summary of this code of conduct, um, which I'm sure everybody can um, get along just fine with. Um, so just before we get started as well, we'd love to introduce you to our fantastic society. Um, we've got an environmental sustainability society for students to join and a thriving Facebook and Discord group as well. Um, and we'd love some more volunteers um, to help really lift this off the ground for more events for students, events just like this one um, to try and grow this community of like minded students. If you think that sounds like you or something you'd really like to be involved in, um, you can pop along to the Facebook group. They're quite easy to find. Um, I'm sure someone from the staff team is probably going to ping a link in there at some point, but you can find us under clubs and societies as well. Um, my email is there. It's a fairly easy email address. It's just lou.robinson at open.ac.uk. Um, you can also find me under student leaders on the OU students website. Um, do get in touch if you'd really like to help us lift that society a little bit further. And thank you, Jess, for the link. Um, you can also post on there as well. I'm on there quite frequently. So if you wanted to post in there anything as well, I'm sure I could pick it up um, and help you find your, your place in the society and grow it to something amazing. Um, but we've got loads to get through tonight. Very, very excited for this evening. Um, so I'm going to introduce our first speaker, um, Dr. Marcus Badger, who's going to be talking to us today about how we can use the rock record to understand the Earth's climate system. Very, very exciting. As a geology student, I'm all over this. So excited um, to hear this talk. So I'm going to hand over to Marcus. Thank you. Um, thanks everyone for uh, coming. Hope you can all hear me OK. Um, thank you for all spending um, a little time this evening. Um, with us, uh, yes, I am. Uh, I'm Dr. Marcus Badger, and yeah, I'm going to talk today um, a little bit about um, my uh, research and the work that I do at the Open University. Um, I'm going to give it a fairly broad focus. I'm going to talk about a lot of the background as to kind of why we do what we do um, and try not to get too techy. Um, but if you've got questions about some of the specifics of of how we work and um, and why we do the things we do and, and, and how it works, then I'm I'm really happy uh, to answer any um, any questions in the in, in the panel discussion, and that's absolutely fine. Um, now, hopefully, I can take control. Yes, there we go. Great. Uh, so, uh, yes, so I'm Dr. Marcus Badger. Um, I am a, a senior lecturer in earth sciences at the Open University. Um, I work in uh, the STEM faculty. I'm an um, academic, central academic in the School of Environment, Earth and Ecosystem Sciences. Um, I'm an ocean going geologist. Um, the picture of me there um, on the slide is uh, a few years ago now, but that's me on board the Royal Research Ship uh, Discovery on a rather grey day somewhere in the Labrador Sea. Um, I'm a paleoclimate scientist, which means I study um, the Earth's climate and the Earth's climate system, but on a kind of uh, a, a focus on um, the past. So that's what the paleo bit in paleo climate scientist is. And I um, look at uh, climate change over kind of multi-million year um, timescales. 
I'm an organic geochemist, and that means that I use um, biomarkers. So these are kind of molecular fossils um, that are left behind when um, organisms die. And I use the, the chemistry and the chemical signals that are preserved in those um, biomarkers, those molecular fossils, again, which can be preserved for millions of years um, to tell us things about environmental change. As well as my research, um, I am module team co-chair of S112 Science Concepts and Practice, so it's really great to see some um, S112 current students uh, in the room and um, I look forward to welcoming those who uh, will be joining us on S112 Science Concepts and Practice shortly. And I'm also um, I'm qualification lead for R53 BSc Geology, so um, any questions about any of those uh, things, if, if you want to ask, then I'm, I'm more than happy to um, answer those tonight as well. So this is um, a kind of modified made up quote, uh, which says that the present is the key to the past. And so the past can be the key to the future. And this is a kind of um, what I call a modified uniformitarianist principle. Now, uniformitarianism um, is kind of one of the central tenets of um, geology. Um, and it says that if we can understand the present, um, then we can understand the past. And that's because if we can understand processes that are happening on the Earth today um, and forming rocks today and forming sediments and um, and and minerals, then we can look at uh, evidence of those same processes happening in the past and we can understand um, how those processes might have happened in the past uh, because we understand them in the present. And I take that um, one step further in my research, um, which is what most paleoclimate scientists do and say so that actually because we can understand the past and we can understand past environmental change then actually that can also um, be the key to understanding the future um, and that's because uh, the earth is this kind of an earth history is this kind of great natural experiment um, that allows us to uh, understand how the earth system works and how the climate system works we know that uh, the climate is changing. We know pretty confidently that um, that's caused by anthropogenic change, that's caused by human influence. Um, but exactly how that climate system works is really complicated. And we can build these um, fantastic Earth system models, computational models, using our understanding of the climate system uh, in the present. But there's a lot of uncertainty there because of how complicated the system is. And one way we can test those climate models and test our understanding of um, of what might happen in the future is look to the past to, to reconstruct how um, the Earth's climate has changed in the past naturally, understand what the effects and the causes of that have been and use that understanding to better build our models and to better understand what's likely to happen um, in the future. And my um, research generally focuses on carbon dioxide, atmospheric carbon dioxide. So this is uh, one of these really important uh, greenhouse gases. Um, it's a greenhouse gas which is uh, has a, a great influence on the climate system, despite it being present um, in the atmosphere only in parts per million. Um, and it's an important greenhouse gas, not least because it's a greenhouse gas that we are influencing. So this is a uh, record um, on the on the chart here of changing carbon dioxide concentration um, over the uh, the last few decades. And this uh, is the more this is the Mauna Loa and Mauna Kea um, records. So this is a record of atmospheric uh, carbon dioxide measured um, in the atmosphere by scientists uh, at the time. And we've got this long record that goes back now to uh, 1960. And there are two kind of main features uh, that you can see in this record. Um, one is this kind of uh, gentle but fairly constant rise in atmospheric CO2 from kind of uh, levels of around 310 parts per million um, in the 1960s uh, to over 400 um, parts per million today. So already we can see that just over a few um, decades we've, we've, we've uh, added an extra 100 parts per million of CO2 um, to the atmosphere. Um, and then the other thing that you can see in this record, which is um, really interesting, is this kind of zigzag on it. And that's the um, that is a uh, uh, an annual change that happens each year. And that's essentially the Earth um, biosphere breathing in and out. Um, when uh, trees create leaves, um, they uh, draw down CO2 from the atmosphere and then um, when they shed them, it goes back in because most of the trees um, in the uh, most of the landmass on the on the Earth 
is in the Northern Hemisphere. That's uh, biased towards um, Northern Hemisphere seasons, and that's what that change is. But that record, which tells us a lot about how carbon dioxide is changing and how um, that might influence um, the climate system, only goes back to 1960. And in order to go back further and understand uh, longer changes in, um, in carbon dioxide, we can't rely on instrumental records, the so records that are taken at the time, because people weren't measuring it. So for that, we go uh, to ice sheets. Now, when snow falls um, and, uh, and forms ice, it forms layers. Layers build up year on year on year, especially in the high Arctic and Antarctic. Um, and within that, that snow and ice is trapped bubbles of the atmosphere. And if we go down to those places um, and we drill, we can drill these really long records of um, ice. And then if we melt out that ice, we melt out and release those bubbles of atmospheric um, of the atmosphere and we can measure the CO2 in that. And this image is um, a uh, an image of a recent camp um, on the green. Uh, I think this is Antarctic, I think this is Antarctic ice sheet. I haven't labeled that figure, apologies for that. It's probably in the alt text um, um, of a recent expedition um, to measure uh, atmospheric ice, atmospheric um, CO2 in the ice. And with that, we can push back our record to thousands and hundreds of thousands of years. So now on this graph, I, um, this now is again atmospheric CO2 concentration, and it goes from zero, so zero thousands of years, so the present day, um, on the right uh, to 800,000 years on the left. And what we can see in this record is that um, today's levels are right at the top, 400 ppm is, is uh, shown there for 2020. Um, but for much of the last 800,000 years, CO2 has been much lower. And so there's two things that we can see from this figure. One is that CO2 is much lower for 800,000 years, um, but also it's got this kind of zigzag again, an up and down pattern, and that's uh, CO2 changing and causing the uh, long um, ice ages, uh, periodic ice ages over the last 800,000 years. Now we have ice that goes back 800,000 years, but what if we wanted to go further? Well, just like ice and snow building up in layers over time, rocks do exactly the same in ocean basins. This is a photo of uh, Bridport Sands down in Dorset, and you can see here the layers of, um, of material that's built up over time. And although this doesn't trap atmospheric um, the atmosphere in it in the same way that ice does, what it does is it preserves information about what was happening when it was deposited. And if we can um, measure and uh, de uh, and, and, and understand what those changes in rocks are telling us, we can understand about environmental change. And to do that, we don't often go um, to uh, land sections, we are quite often go to the ocean, because in the ocean we have these fantastic pristine layers of sediment built up um, at the bottom of the ocean. And we do that on these big drill ships. This is the Geordie's Resolution, which is part of an um, international collaboration that has drilled um, ocean sediments from all over the world. That's why I am an ocean going geologist. Um, and we've been doing this for, again for decades. So we've got these fantastic records of sediments um, from around ocean basins. And this allows us to go back many millions of years. And if we can um, understand what, this, the, the, what those sediments are telling us, we can understand things about environmental change. We can understand about um, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. I do it using. Um, uh, an algae called a coccolithophore, which is a microscopic algae. These are kind of um, uh, 10 to 14 microns across, um, but they have a huge influence on the carbon cycle and they're really, really populous in the world. This is an image of a satellite image of a coccolithophore bloom. So this is an unimaginable, the, the milky blue uh, material is an unimaginable number of um, organisms blooming off the Nordic Sea. And all of that material goes back, to, uh, settles down uh, to um, the sea floor, building up those layers. And then if we can um, uh, understand the geochemical signals in those algae, um, we can reconstruct CO2. And I'm not going to talk about how we do that, but I'm happy to answer questions on that um, uh, in, in the questions. These are beautiful things. This is some, um, a microscope um, image of them. Each of these are individual cells. Um, and like I say, they're really tiny um, organisms, but there's very, very many of them. And by using the geochemical signals in these organisms and others, we now are able to generate CO2 records that span back millions of years and tens of millions of years. And this is um, a figure from a paper uh, that a large um, uh, uh, consortium of scientists uh, brought out very recently. I was a member of this consortium, and this shows our current understanding of CO2 over 
many many tens of millions of years. This one's spanning back to almost six uh, to 66 million years ago. And what this shows us, there are two lines on there. One is CO2 and one is an estimate of global temperature. Is again, as CO, we can now reconstruct CO2 on these very long time scales, but we can also see that that um, link between CO2 and temperature has been um, consistent even on these kind of very multi-million year timescales and by looking at the details of that we can really understand our climate system better and make better predictions for the um, end of the century and beyond. So I'll wrap up there because I think I'm coming to the end of my time. Um, just say a few very brief conclusions. Our climate is changing. Uh, we can learn about the future by studying the past in these ways through um, geology and the um, ocean sediments um, allow us. Uh, <laughs> I can see you can see that I got this uh, final slide from a different talk when I included something else. So this, this originally read ocean sediments and climate models. Um, ocean sediments and climate models um, allow climate reconstruction um, into the geological past. Um, but I will stop there. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, that was a fantastic and very, very interesting talk. I can see already we're getting some uh, amazing um, comments coming through. Um, surprises over the CO2 and Jess has already popped a question in for us because she'd love to know more about how the algae reconstruct CO2. Um, yeah, it's a great question. <laughs> um, so uh, the algae are photosynthetic, which is um, the first part. So that means that uh, they have to live uh, in the top part of the oceans because they have to um, photosynthesize. So they have to live in that kind of top 100 meters of the ocean, which sunlight penetrates it. That's re that's really important. Step one. That's why they're really useful. Um, that means that they're in a body of water which is in contact with the atmosphere. And so um, because of something called Henry's law, um, the uh, the concentration of CO2 that is in those surface ocean waters is linked to the uh, atmospheric CO2. So we um, have uh, an algae that lives in waters and those waters have an atmospheric, have a CO2 concentration, which is linked to um, the atmosphere. So if there are changes in the atmosphere, there are changes in that um, ocean water. Now, very conveniently, um, the, those, um, those algae record the CO2 concentration of the seawater in their biomolecules. So there is a molecular fossil called an alkanone, which is a long chain ketone, um, which has a um, isotopic composition which varies in the algae um, with the concentration of CO2 in the surface waters. So as the surface waters change, the isotopic composition of those compounds in the algae change. And then so what we can do is because those algae and those bio, um, molecular fossils are preserved and settle down into the um, uh, ocean floor is if we can go back and get them and tell how old they are, which we can using a bunch of different processes, um, we can measure the carbon isotopic composition of those particular molecules um, and uh, then we can use that to understand the concentration of CO2 in the surface waters and then we can use that to understand the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere and it kind of works it's great and I had some brand new data on it today which is very exciting. Amazing thank you really great explanation there as well um, so thank you for that one and I've got <laughs> an interesting one here a little, little bit of confusion going on in the chat Jess would like to know how you got into this field um, but has been corrected since by Kevin's um, comment of get into this ocean <laughs> <laughs> um i just it's it's a i just kind of meandered into it really um i um uh, i did an earth sciences degree uh as my undergraduate and then as part of i had a i had a fourth year project working in a lab where i actually um grew these algae so i had little pet little bottles of cochlear spores like hundreds of thousands of them that lived in a fridge um, uh, and I grew them and used them to we were trying to develop a geochemical proxy for something completely different that actually we never actually finished because it was a fourth year undergrad you never have time um, but that kind of led me into the that that led me to really love geochemistry and the kind of using um, using kind of chemical signals to understand 
past climates that was really fascinating and it also was lots of fun lab work which i really love um which i don't get to do anymore um and uh working with mass spectrometers which are these big shiny machines that are right pain but when they work well they're really fun um so i did that as, as an as an undergrad and then uh my phd was on this kind of stuff i found a phd that i like the sound of and we moved more into the kind of organic geochemistry part and then i just kind of kept going you just kind of meander around <laughs> but yeah that's how that's that's how, how it got there but yes yeah, so it all started with a geology degree and the geology program at the ou if anybody's still trying to choose their pathway highly recommend it it's fantastic um i'm having a great time um related question um sam would like to know if you get seasick um i never used to i so i i've got seasick seasick once badly uh sailing on a uh 70 foot sailing boat from um uh from harwich to the netherlands but that was a very long time ago um i didn't used to think i did i don't get when i'm at sea and i've been out on expeditions three times three times like big like multi-month long expeditions um i didn't used to think i got seasick at all and then I, it was suddenly pointed out to me the kind of nasty bleh, feeling and like being tired all the time at the beginning of expeditions was probably a bit of seasickness but no fortunately i i don't um my partner who um is uh, dr kirsty edgar who works at the university of birmingham she does very similar stuff to me and she's been to see more than me she gets terribly seasick but she just keeps doing this to herself and i don't i don't really understand it there are plenty of scientists who go to the sea um who do get horribly seasick and they'll have they'll manage it one way or another um but yeah i'm okay usually that's good to know um and good to know that you can push through it as well um yeah we've got yeah. More, <laughs> yeah. there are wonderful drugs as well we, we generally go to sea with uh with medical doctors especially if we're going somewhere silly like labrador sea and uh, there is a, there's now a vast range of seasickness tablets you just right. have to find the right one Um, yeah, so we've got some more questions coming th through as well. Do keep them coming because we've got a couple of minutes left. So I think, uh, yeah, it's still more coming through with medications for seasickness. So um, if you're worried about seasickness, <laughs> it sounds like it's very positive news for you and that you could still have a career at sea. Um, we've got a question from Robert who would like to know, do algal blooms have an effect on the keeling curve or do these happen more in the northern hemisphere also? So, um, because, so, on kind of, so do they have an effect on the keeling curve? Um, no, probably not detectable. Um, they, the, and that's because there's the, I mean, the, the, um the the big one that we that you see that annual pattern because that's kind of an, the entire i mean a, a, some some of that probably is algal biomass actually but the the biggest part of that is trees because trees do are big and there are lots of them and they take up vast amounts of carbon in the spring and then they dump it all out at the end of the um, autumn um so does it do algal blooms affect the killing curve no probably not not um if we really look for it we might be able to see it what um algal blooms are part of is the general carbon cycle and they do play an important part in um in moving carbon around um the ocean system and in and out of the ocean system so like i said the, you've, you know you've got the atmosphere in in contact with um, the surface waters when they are blooming they are taking up huge amounts of carbon into their cells and then a lot of those will sink down to the bottom and that is part an important part of the carbon cycle and one of the sinks of carbon from the surface waters to uh, the deep ocean and eventually the sediment so yeah they are they they do they are um even though they're tiny tiny weedy there are enough of them that they do have a an impact on the carbon cycle um for kind of idea of scale again you know the the they they make calcium carbonate lists so they um are on their exoskeleton and that's the kind of things that you you could see um around them in that that image and the chalk is made up of those lists so that's the kind of scale of of amount of uh, material that they can take out of of, of the ocean system at, at times, but that's just like the chalk has an unimaginable number of um, cochlea in. Thank you so much for that. Um, and thank you, Robert, for your question. We've got just one more question, um, but we'll keep it quite brief. So um, Fiona's interested to know what research that you're undertaking at the moment. 
Uh, so I currently have um, I'm working on a few bits and pieces, but the, the biggest project is I'm working on a, um, uh, a project funded by the Natural Environment Research Council, um, which is uh, looking at understanding how um, the uh, the God, I'm really bad at elevator pitch for this project, which is bizarre. Um, <laughs> which is looking at the Pliocene, which is an interval of time uh, two and a half to five million years ago. Uh, so it's uh, the last, the most recent warm interval um, where uh, things were much warmer than today. Um, and we're looking in detail using this alkanone system and this way of reconstructing CO2 to kind of understand in, in detail how CO2 and temperature varied in the Pliocene. Um, so yeah, that's the project that I'm involved in um, at the moment. Fabulous. Thank you so much. Um, we are going to have to stop there, I'm afraid, but thank you so much, Marcus, for your no, fantastic cool. presentation and the answers to all these incredible questions we've had come in. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. Um, and, and thank you to everyone for your questions. Excellent. Um, so, absolutely fantastic start to this evening. Um, if you've just joined us, um, we have um, just finished our wonderful um, talk with Marcus. Um, we are recording. So hopefully we can catch up. And if you do have questions, um, we did manage to get some kind of post session last time, and I'm sure we could always pass some questions over. Um, so if there's any burning questions, please do, do keep them coming in the chat. Um, but thank you so much to Marcus for a fantastic start to this evening. It's been a huge pleasure. Thank you. And we're going to keep um, going this evening. So fantastic start, um, but even more exciting to come. Um, because we are now introducing the wonderful Ramla Khan, um, who's a PhD student in the School of Environment, Earth and Ecosystem Sciences. Um, if you've ever had the chance um, to come to the Milton Keynes campus, <laughs> and you may have seen some trees that you might recognise in this presentation. I'm very excited to hear more about them as a frequent campus visitor. Um, so maybe one to keep an eye out for, um, but I'm going to hand over to Ramla. Oh, I think you're just muted, Ramla, sorry. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> There's always that one person, and I guess the time it was me. Um, yeah, no, I said, uh, thanks for the opportunity and thanks for that introduction. Most people do know me on campus uh, as the girl on the trees, uh, but depending on which circles that you hang out with, um, the ground team who actually erected the whole system referred to me as the she devil who made them all do all the work. So I would say stay clear of them if you want good reputation of mine. Uh, anyway, uh, today I'm talking about my research and my research in a nutshell is about climate change and I am looking at how heat affects urban trees, both on surface level and on leaf level. So for that purpose, my, I have done the research in three different parts. The first part was looking through remote sensing and satellite data, the past um, trend of uh, how the health of vegetation changed using GCI. And then the second part is uh, some field study. And the third part is a control study where I uh, manipulated the temperature inside the lab for the leaf and so at which temperature was the uh, photosynthesis optimum and which temperature was when I saw the degradation or the breakdown. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar with how satellite data works, so basically satellites, they orbit the Earth and collect data. Uh, depending, uh, there are different kinds of satellites. Three main ones that are open source is Modest Landsat and Sentinel. They all have their own advantages and uses they use for different purposes. I have used Sentinel because uh, my study area is small, so I needed a better resolution, which is 10 meters special resolution from Sentinel. And it collects data at every five days. Now, um, the thing about the image uh, or the animation on the left side is it was specially featured last year on ESA website because it's a very rare image. It says cloud free Europe and it never happens. Like there's always cloud here. So cloud is not only uh, the reason we don't get enough vitamin D, it also um, 
is a hindrance when you are working on satellite data because it's biasness and if you want to look at the earth you have to um, remove these clouds and everything and because of that so so much data gets lost in the process um, anyway so moving forward and how you do that how you collect data from the set, uh, satellite is you give it a shape file uh, a mask to tell them to only for this area uh, i need the data and i since i'm working on urban trees and urban trees of milton Keynes, so we manually digitize this area with the help of my supervisor phil wheeler and so i used the um, a uh, UK Center of Ecology and Hydrology tree cover map, but by looking at closely at them, I realized that there was so much misclassified pixels. So to remove that, I use the audience survey um, uh, data for different infrastructure. Um, for a different infrastructure, I use that and I clipped the image and then uh, identified some errors and those that were left behind. Uh, there, those is the mask I have used and the last third image you can see the rectified trees and the errors. The black ones are errors. This is the misclassified pixels. This is just a result uh, from like I have lots of there's a lots of map, but this is the map I chose to present here and um, to this doctor on the side. Uh, he's better than an NHS doctor, by the way. You can get an appointment with him more easily than with the GP of your area. And so what's happening here is I have used um, two different years as an example. 2018 was incredibly warm. Uh, well, 2021 was um, like the normal year, the normal year that's uh, in UK. So uh, looking at that, I uh, took the start of season map and the end of the season vegetation health map. So this image over here, this image over here uh, is 2018 June which is green everything and at the end of season the plants they follow a pattern. There is a seasonal pattern. Uh, and you can see the seasonal pattern got uh, broken because the trees at the end are extremely stressed and that was because of extremely warm uh, season and five heat waves in that season one after the other while in 2021 there was just one mild heat wave that didn't have much impact you can see that uh, again the start of the season is the green like usual and then the end of season they have came back to its uh, not the original state that happens then late in September, but they have um, like followed the normal seasonal pattern. Now this is the first half or the first uh, of the three parts of my research. Uh, in the second part, I have used uh, I have used uh, I'm using some experimental and setup uh, on campus and uh, the one that Lou mentioned this is outside EGL lab and Robert Hook building if anyone of you ever come out come on campus uh, that's where they are they don't look uh, in a very nice state right now because uh, all the leaves have fallen down but and how I picked those trees was I used the Treezilla database um, in trees database, I look at which is the common tree species in Milton Keynes. Among those common tree species, which is then available for purchase in the nursery at the time, because apparently you can't buy just any tree in the nursery. Not all of them are for sale, even if they are there. Um, so, and by the way, I'm open to suggestions on names uh, to come up with this whole system. So we have this big water reservoir. It gives water to the small float chamber over here. And the height of this float chamber determines the water level inside these pots. These pots have pebble layer and then sand layer, and top of that is the clay layer. Uh, now, the reason we have uh, done this so that they can get constantly watered so they don't get into drought stress because uh, heat waves and drought and some natural, uh, natural hazards, they, uh, they're interconnected. And in order to remove that biasness, so we don't see drought stress in the data, we just concentrate on the heat ones. We are constantly giving them water and then monitoring them afterwards. And the next image, yeah. This is some of the images of the apparatuses I've used, and so that's me in the first picture and the trees. Uh, it will, if you can uh, see, uh, I got text from someone saying the research images are not showing on the slide. It's, it's just your video. I don't know if everyone is having this issue. Um, okay, so. 
uh, this is uh, me on the trees uh, that I'm collecting the fluorometer uh, through fluorometer, the fluorescence value, chlorophyll fluorescence value. This is the apparatus I have used. Then we have the spectrometer, which inside the lab through external extra extractions, I took the chlorophyll values. And this is dry shipper for storing flash freezing samples. Of course, if you, we use the simple freezer once, but then chlorophyll degradation happens. So for that, we need flash freezing to get the chlorophyll value after uh, remove the samples from the trees. And this is the dry shipper we have uh, used for that purpose. Um, anyway, moving on. Um, so this is the results that I'm sharing here is from 2022. So for 2022 was a really interesting air heat wave wise that there were like uh, in the June, beginning of June, there was a heat wave, then there was a uh, warm air, but the end of July and beginning of August, there was one after the other mega, mega heat waves. And usually, and usually like on surface, you can easily see the, um, how the trees change their health and everything because of even small anomalies in the weather. But on leaf level in chlorophyll, it rarely happens. And in 2022 data, it actually did. Um, the chlorophyll uh, uh, curve, especially, you can see that it's uh, it usually goes down smoothly and then uh, falls down smoothly as well. But because of the two heat waves, one after the other, there's it's a sharp decline, a very sharply it has fall down. So this is a cause for concern, which means uh, the climate here, are the trees here are not um, ready to get adapted to a temperature as high as uh, 43 degrees C. Uh, because last year was the highest temperature was 43, uh, and that's that's a bit cause for concern. And that was that thing thinking was the reason I came up with the last part of the research, a controlled study where inside the lab I used a water bath and increased the temperature in marginals and looked at the FEFM value, which is um, how you look at the photosynthesis value and the metabolic capacity. Uh, so you looked at that data. Uh, so by doing that, I slowly increased the temperature and looked if at which temperature uh, was optimal and which temperature was when the photosynthesis or the trees started or the plants started giving up uh, altogether. So the board, uh, so, uh, on the right hand side, uh, these the T critical and T50, I have used two parameters. T critical is when the FEFM value starts declining, and T50 is when it reduces by 50%. So, um, this season, uh, it wasn't on intention, but the trees fell down um, at one point, and because of the falling down, they stopped getting water. And they automatically went into drought stress. And as it happens, I collected the data. I did that experiment before that happened and after that happened. And what interesting information was that these trees, even though uh, this this uh, first graph especially, this is when the disaster happened. So you can see that the tree critical and T50 value are um, really low compared to the rest of the results. But then I leave, left it in 24 hours for hydration and then checked the value again. And when I checked the value, it was close to the original one, like how it usually was during this experiment. So uh, between 53 to 56 is like no matter the circumstances for the temperature when the chlorophyll or FFM value completely uh, would break down. So that means the tree species as a compestrialic and or field maple, which is a common tree species, not just in Milton Keynes, but uh, also throughout the UK, is um, cannot survive beyond 53, no matter what. They can come back on other temperatures. But so this research were here. The um, reason, other reason you can look at it is we can advise the council later which tree species to plant and which not to plant. Um, people in ecology side or environmental sciences, even they are aware of certain things. Like, for example, in the cancel uh, park, you walk around, you see lots of pine trees. And anyone could tell you uh, with, with a bit of knowledge that that is a very bad decision because those trees, they don't belong here. They are making the soil acidic and that is not good for the environment. So every every area or every environment, uh, they need a specific kind of greenery. And this the purpose of this research was to look at because the temperature is changing, climate is changing, to look at uh, 
if the current tree species, the current urban trees, are they adaptable? Um, are they adaptable uh, to the changing temperature? And the answer is that not all of them, like uh, field maple especially, um, it's very common. It's very common. It makes me really sad when I was looking at that results. Um, so I think I have taken lots of time, so I should just zip it. Uh, thank you all for your uh, consideration and listening to me. Uh, if there are any questions, uh, let me know. Uh, um, either in chat, uh, send me an email, however you feel comfortable. Thank you so, so much. It's been an absolute pleasure to hear more about your research. Um, I remember Thank training you. with you for the Bananas game. Um, <laughs> she played yeah. back in September at the Freshers and um, I really wanted to know more, but it was such a packed day. Um, so it's been a wonderful opportunity to, to finally hear more about this. And I hope it, it seems everybody's really enjoyed it in the chat as well. We've got some questions coming through already. Jess says, it's really great to hear about the applications of your research. Um, Quite an interesting question. What's going to happen to these trees? So how old are they? And will they have to be moved into bigger pots over time? Uh, so these trees, they when we uh, bought them and they came on campus, they were like medium height. Uh, and next year, in the next year, they grew up so tall that we had to then get a tower for me to reach them. I'm a short person in general, but it became a joke. She can't reach her trees. So uh, these trees are not that all, I uh, would say one, two years. And yes, they, 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 they will be moved on campus. So the uh, students actually who helped me, volunteers in planting them into the pots, they, all of them, they have like, they just made the decision without involving, said they are named after us. So every tree is named after the student who helped me <laughs> plant them and they will be moved um, to get planted on campus. Amazing, thank you. And that's answered Sam's question there as well. <laughs> I'm very interested to hear about the trees' names. So, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> please hear they have names. Um, Jess would also like to know: Do you plan to complete the research on other species? Uh, that depends. Is there funding available for me to do that? <laughs> yeah, but yeah, it's it's interesting research, and you have like. Um, uh, so many people have started getting ideas for that because uh, th this is not a very widely done research. And so like there's some research available on oak trees and some others. But yeah, I would like to uh, if there's opportunity. Fabulous. Um, there's a little uh, comment from Jess that she hopes they will have little name plaques, which I quite like the idea of. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Fiona yeah, it would be cute. Fiona would like to know how you got into the research. Oh, <laughs> that's a good question. Uh, no, so like basically I did my undergrads in civil engineering and then my master's in remote sensing and GIS. Uh, but, through, but throughout my career, I have always worked on natural disasters actually. So like uh, landslides, uh, earthquakes, flash flooding, uh, droughts in my master's. Um, and I was part of a Sparco team, which is the space agency of my country. And I worked with some natural disasters who were there as well. So when I came here and my supervisor actually said to me, uh, you need to come up with your own project idea. Uh, because the one you applied to is not that big. Uh, so it was actually small, but this whole thing is my brainchild. So I'm quite proud of that as well. And yeah, so I looked at it and I said, well, Heatwave is a natural hazard that you can see in UK more frequently and looking at the changing temperature. I thought, uh, well, it's a risk, but I can take this and say that, um, yeah, you should do that. Amazing. Thank you. Um, it's always lovely to hear everybody's kind of journey through this, especially yeah. with so many students in the audience. It's just that we all take a huge interest then because yeah. we're all wondering <laughs> where to go next. Um, so it's nice to hear these really diverse journeys yeah. um, along the way as well. Um, yeah. So amazing. I think we've wrapped up on the questions in the chat, but do keep them coming. So do po keep popping questions across. And I think you said you know, it's fine to reach out by email as well, um, but we can always pass questions on as well. So if yes. you do have a question and 
you've not managed to get it in, do pop it in the chat. We are going to take a short break now. Um, but before I do, I just want to say a huge thank you to Ramla. That was an amazing talk. Some great <laughs> questions coming in, really engaging and just wonderful to hear about um, research going on on the yeah. campus in Milton Keynes. And we'll be sure to think of you when we see the, your trees. <laughs> and um, all the wonderful students that have been helping plant them as well. Um, yeah. So thank you so much. We have got two more fantastic panel speakers this evening. Um, so do try and stay with us. We'll be here till eight o'clock. Um, and next up, we have the fantastic Dr. Kevin Collins, who's going to be talking to us a little bit about some system thinking and the different, the new ways of thinking that sustainability requires. So very, very interesting. Um, and I'm going to hand over to Kevin. Great, thank you, Luke. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, so I'm Kevin Collins. I'm Senior Lecturer in Environment and Systems here at the OU, as you know. Um, and uh, most of my talk is going to be just trying to explore a little bit about how we think about systems and, and the relationship to sustainability. Um, just a very briefly background. I mean, I'm, I'm um, production chair for various environmental management uh, modules, and I'm also qualification lead for environmental management at undergraduate level. So if you're doing some of these pathways, you'll bump into some of these modules and some of these ideas um, that I'll just be briefly talking about today. And it will be brief. Um, I, it's As we've been seeing, it's very hard to condense a big subjects into 10 minutes, but we'll give it a try. So, um, you probably know the answer to this, um, but there's a word that's missing in all of these terms. And um, I'm hoping you're all going to guess within the first three seconds of reading this uh, what that missing word is. And Marcus actually mentioned quite a few of them already. Um, so I'm, I'm sure you're going to guess that it's the word. And it's this word. With them. And it's a really important word because we use it all the time. You will, it's really hard almost to talk about the environment and, and broadly speaking, and lots of um, discussion on news items in the media. You'll see this word all the time represented and used. The trouble is, um, as my colleague Ray Eisen says, it's actually gone feral. We've forgotten actually what it means. So we'll see if we can recover some of that understanding a little bit this, this evening. Why is it important? Well, it's important because we talk about the environment and we talk about systems and we talk about sustainability often in the same sentence um, in various ways. Um, and critically, if we're thinking about sustainability, if we're trying to understand or define sustainability, we're going to use the word system. Um, and here's a definition that we use in our undergraduate teaching um, in the modules that I write. And it's about this relationship between humans and the environment, and that's a system in itself, that relationship. And it's depicted here uh, visually, the social and the biophysical. And there's some kind of interaction between them, there's an interchange. And the extent to which we can say we are being sustainable or we are achieving sustainability or becoming more sustainable depends on that relationship, what is happening between those two different um, systems. And of course, these are all happening at local, national, regional and international levels. So that interchange has always been varied by geographic scale as well as time. So that's sustainability and that's why systems, the word system is really important um, because sustainability depends on that systemic relationship. So what do we mean by system in itself? Um, as I said, it's gone feral and we've forgotten what it means. We tend to use the word system as something that exists out, out there in the real world that we can engineer, that we can manipulate, we can construct, we can reconstruct um, often. But there's also ways of thinking about systems as much more of a sort of an idea, um, something we can use to make sense of the complexity and the confusion of the world around us. And that's the area that I'm much more interested in. Um, because I think that's the area where sustainability becomes really interesting because it's a negotiation of that complexity for making changes. What is a system then? It actually, the word system comes from the Greek verb synhistonai and it means to place together. It doesn't, it doesn't just happen, it's something's done by someone to make something a system. And so it's an organised whole defined by someone as having a purpose and it's observer dependent. It doesn't exist out there independently of you or the people around it. Um, it's a distinction people are making all the time. 
And they do that by identifying relationships between things and then drawing a boundary around that thing and calling it something. And if you want a really, really um, simple way of thinking about it, you know, a bicycle is a system um, in itself. Uh, there's nothing there's nothing you've added to the bicycle, but it's made up of all different component parts and it becomes a bicycle. Why is this important for the environment? Um, because we use it's a really important way of thinking about how we understand the environment. So here's a picture of somebody thinking about a pond or a wetland and they've identified relationships um, around bird life, fish, aquatic plants and they put a boundary around that and said that's the pond or that's the wetland and these sort of background elements the the, the trees the uh, hills have all disappeared away now that's their system that's their pond system and their analysis and their investigation of that pond or their thinking about that pond will be determined by where they've drawn that boundary and into relationships they've seen but of course other people might see that um, pond differently they might want to say well you've forgotten about something else I have a different view of that pond. So there's a key thing that we need to think about here that it's not only making boundary choices and identifying relationships, but when you're doing systems thinking, you're also trying to be aware of the multiple perspectives in the situation. Now, I, I'm unsure if you can see quite the detail of this, and it's less important perhaps because I'll talk through it. But at the top of this, you've got a, a graphic, a cartoon graphic of situation, which is a rural landscape with a family, a farming family, their crops, their cow, and a, the hinterland behind, and a helicopter in the sky. And that's the situation that exists, sort of in in there in the world. But our view of it is shaped by how we think about that system. So if you're an agronomist, for example, your whole framing is determined by what's actually interesting from an agronomy point of view, in which case this is just the farmer in the fields. If you're an ecologist, you might be much more interested in the relationship and the energy relationships between the cow and the farmer and the fields and so on. If you're a sociologist, forget the, forget the cow almost, forget the fields. What you're interested in is the dynamics between the family. And that becomes your main frame of interest. An animal scientist, forget everything except the animal and maybe the farmer who's looking after it. And then the really key thing for sustainability is how do we recover that richness that we've lost through our individual framings? And the key thing here in that bottom slide is we've tried to put all the dis interdisciplinary team, tries to recapture all of that. You won't get ever back to the actual richness of the real world because there's an argument saying we can never fully understand that richness of the real world, but we can try and understand it in partial views. And it's only by combining those multiple perspectives that we begin to understand things systemically. And that's the key for systems thinking and sustainability. Now, I've shown you quite a few diagrams, um, and that's a key thing that systems thinking in the OU tradition tries to use because we think it's a really powerful way of um, engaging and learning. So I'm just going to briefly and give you a flavour of some of the types of diagrams we use. I'm, you don't need to see the detail, that's not important. I'm just going to show you the way we use them. Um, if you want to see more details, there's a link there. And if you do a Google search for Open Learn, a guide to diagrams, um, you'll see actually much more um, uh, full explanation and use of diagrams in various environmental type situations. So, very briefly, is oh yeah i forgot about this this if you're thinking why is he telling me all about this this is probably the one of the most famous diagrams in science and um 10 points if you can tell me who's actually who's done this uh, diagram um and of course it is the world famous scientist and i'm gonna click on that charles darwin charles darwin um this is his diagramming in his notebook and uh, what he's done here is to use a diagram to understand transmutation of species or you know, evolution of species in modern parlance. And he's drawn the diagram and he's put things on that diagram and he's written an explanation all the way um, of how he's understanding and using this diagram to interpret his own thoughts and to learn. And if you think I'm being slightly uh, over energetic about that, um, there's a really key phrase right at the top of that, that diagram, which is I think. And that's what, how we want to use diagrams in the in systems thinking. They're learning devices. They're thinking devices. They're not there to represent reality in, in the such, but they're there to help you learn and think. And that's their prime purpose. 
and so doing, here's a map of a systems map. You may, if you've ever done any work on stakeholders or tried to map stakeholders, you'll have seen something very similar to this kind of thing. Um, here's a map I drew for some chalk river restoration that we're currently in research, we're currently involved in. The detail doesn't matter. The fact is, is that having drawn that and made some boundary choices about what's in and what's out of this system of stakeholders, I can then take that and show it to other people and say, this is my understanding of who's a stakeholder here. And in so doing, it becomes a very powerful learning device. Again, very much like Charles Darwin, although I'm not going to position myself anywhere near Charles Darwin. But in a sense, it becomes a device for learning and thinking about how we understand the situation, who's in it and how what their roles are. We can do very similar sort of things with spray diagrams. You've probably used spray diagrams in even at school or in, in employment situations or just trying to work out what to do on a Sunday morning for the jobs around the house. We use them um, as engaging for all sorts of different processes. Here I'm using them with a group of researchers on Sardinian agriculture, trying to understand agricultural systems in Sardinia. And what's great about using uh, spray diagrams, you can see everything at once in terms of what's important in the situation, the issues, the people, and the plans, future prospects, past histories. It gives you a very systemic view of what you're trying to deal with. And it engage again, you can use it for learning for yourself, but also as a group, as in here, this picture shows. We also use other types of pictures. This is a rich picture, looks pretty frightening. And um, you think, my goodness, this person wants me to draw um, imagery and things, but it's a really powerful way of actually, if you're ever involved in a complex environmental situation, asking people just to just throw stuff down on a piece of paper about what it is they're thinking about the situation in an unstructured way. It's the first step often for divine, uh, developing some structured insights. And you can use this kind of very rich picture, very random unstructured thing um, to actually develop quite a structured analysis. And we can go from that to a much more structured systems map that I showed you earlier. And then if you really want to scale it up, this is just a small group, you can do this in very, very large groups. And like this is a group I was running in Germany, um, looking at how we govern um, sort of policies in the Anthropocene. And here we've gone from a very unstructured kind of conversation maps to again developing systems maps. And to try and understand what actions need to happen to improve governing in the Anthropocene. So if all of that um, makes feels a little bit heavy and a bit complicated. Here's a very short summary. Um, system, the word is absolutely everywhere. You see it in everywhere you go these days in every kind of context. Um, but sustainability is very much, I understand it as a property of human environment systems. And we're, we need to recover our understanding of what we mean by systems. And in my tradition, they're very much observer dependent. And if you want to start systems thinking and practice, you want to become develop your skills in this area, you need to be thinking about relation interrelationships between things. You need to be aware of your boundary choices you're making, what's in, what's out. And also you need to be aware that other people may have very different boundary choices and different perspectives on the situation that you think uh, needs improvement. And one way of doing that and a great sort of learning communication device is about learning for that complexity is to do some diagramming. And if ever you need any inspiration for doing any diagram, just look up towards any very large tree. You'll see the most perfect spray diagram um, in front of your eyes. So I'm going to leave it at that and see if there's any questions. Thank you so much, Kevin. That was a very inspiring talk. And um, no questions just yet, but I think everybody's deep in thought. <laughs> Um, but Jess has shared that she had to draw a rich picture for her last TMA. <laughs> um, she made her very nervous, um, but she really enjoyed it and it got her thinking mm. in a really different way, um, which I guess is the aim of all of this. But I think we've got a question now from Lara. Yeah, Lara would like to know how you got into the field or system. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a really interesting question. Um, there is an argument that most people actually think in systems, they just never learnt the language or the techniques to kind of develop that, that to make it more explicit. Um, I've always kind of seen things quite visually, but I don't mean that in a kind of artistic sense, but I've always tried to kind of um, understand things in relationship to each other. And um, 
my early sort of life was very much being outside in the environment and I always noticed connections between things, how things moved in an environment. So it just seemed a natural progression. And when I came to the OU, I didn't have a language for systems thinking. Um, I didn't really know the discipline, but I was very, very much in environmental science, environmental management, and it just seemed an absolutely seamless transition straight into systems thinking and never looked back. Fabulous. Um, Sam has uh, been eagerly spotting T863 on the slides. Yes. And is asking if this is an OU course. It was. Um, there are still courses that are doing this at postgraduate level, um, but it's not T863. I just took that particular slide. If you put in um, systems thinking um, into the OU sort of um, course finder, you'll see various things. If you can't find anything, we can, I can certainly give you pointers towards it. Um, yeah. Amazing. Thank you. Um, so I think Sam will be off exploring that. Um, Jess would like to know, do you think getting more people to take a systems approach will help as we face climate change? Yeah, I, I, I you probably say I would say this, but yes, I do, because um, systems thinking is really kind of it enables you to see relation interrelationships, how things are connected, not just in a linear sense, um, although that is important. You know, um, if I drive my car more, we get more CO2. That's absolutely true. But when you start to look, use systems thinking, you start to understand the sort of wider consequences, but also that other people have different perspective to you on the situation. And so you just saying don't drive your car because it creates CO2 is actually not necessarily what other people see or hear because they will give you a different perspective on why they need to drive their car. And then once you understand that from a, that they are making a different boundary choice because they have a different perspective, then you can start to have a discussion with them about, well, OK, so how do you make that boundary choice? Why do you have that perspective? Rather than just saying you must. And that's, I think, is the start of a better conversation about sustainability rather than just expecting everybody to ditch their cars. Excellent, really great thought there. Um, and I can see Marcus is eagerly sharing some system diagrams of his own in the chat, um, which is really fab to see. Um, if you can't see those at the moment, they are um, fabulous. Um, and Jess has also um, shared in the chat the system thinking in practice module, I assume that is, yes, or a is, page yeah. from the Open University. Um, so anybody that was asking about that, that link is there. If for some reason you can't see the chat this evening, as I know happens sometimes as a guest on Teams, do just get in touch with us at the association and we'll be able to send that link over to you. Um, I know chat box has a life of, like mind of its own sometimes and we <laughs> sometimes miss some of those messages. Um, but I think that is all our questions for now. But as always, any more questions for Kevin, we'd love to receive them. So do keep popping them in the chat and we can always pass them on for you as well. It's been an absolute pleasure um, listening to your talk and your answers to our fabulous questions this evening, Kevin. Thank you so much for being here. Really appreciate it. Great. No, thanks. Thanks for being here. And I really enjoyed listening to all the different questions. Great. Thank you so much. And we have got, oh, our PowerPoint has just disappeared. I can, I think we're just getting back to where we were. There we go. Fantastic. I'll try and grab that one again. Um, so we now have our final panellist of the evening. Very, very exciting. Um, we've packed so much in um, and it's amazing to see here enjoying all these talks if you just recently joined us and um, we are recording so you'll be able to catch up on any you've missed um, but I've now got the pleasure of introducing Dr Leslie Marbon, who is here to talk to us about how climate change is affecting the UK now um, really exciting and I'm going to hand over to Leslie Great, uh, thank you very much. So, so my name is Leslie Naven and I am a, a lecturer in, in environmental systems also from the the School of Engineering and Innovation. And what I'd like to just talk about for the last <clears throat> 10 minutes or so of the, the session today is something that is perhaps quite uh, pertinent and, and maybe quite timely. Um, that is about adapting to climate change and about uh, this, this idea of what I'm going to 
explain that we, we call resilience. So I've said Scotland here, and because that's where I'm based, but a lot of what, I'm, what it says on this, uh, this slide here is also relevant to the rest of the UK. And that is that um, we are already locked in to effects from climate change. And we have seen some of that already this week. So we had uh, two storms in very quick succession that uh, caused an awful lot of disruption in, in Scotland and in the north of England. So uh, there has been no rail network at all in Scotland since uh, Saturday evening because of these, these, these two storms. So we're already seeing... Uh, weather extremes that are causing damage to buildings, disrupts in transportation. We're seeing flooding to rivers, which again is bringing damage and disruption and danger to, to life. The, the image you've got on the left there, that is from Brechin, in, again in, in Angus in Scotland, from a little bit earlier this, this year. We've got landslides too. Again, we've, we've had roads up in, up, up in Scotland where we are that have been, have been closed in Argyll, uh, where I live, we've had places, that, there was a whole place that was uh, was effectively cut off for about three three months, two, three months, again, because of a, of a landslide. And that's very, you know, very dangerous, but also extremely disruptive, again, to, to, to our economy and to, to life. You know, if, if you're uh, an oyster farmer, if you've got to get your shellfish to market, there's no road, how are you going to do it? Extreme heat. You know, you might we might scoff about some of the temperatures, but but hot weather, even mid high twenties, when buildings and quite frankly human beings are not designed for them, are absolutely no laughing matter. And if you look at the the news media, you'll see a real shift in the last couple of years away from this kind of you know fun in the sun messaging of people lying out in the grass and having ice creams to actually realizing that hot weather, even in the UK, can be extremely dangerous, especially to to older people. Or people working outside. More more dry weather as well. Uh, wildfires, droughts, coastal erosion too. Uh, sea levels rise. You're putting low lying islands, the Outer Hebrides. You're putting coastal settlements, like the ones you maybe have in the East Riding of Yorkshire and, and, and down towards Lincolnshire. Already seeing homes settlements are having to be abandoned because of, of rising sea levels. And so all these things are happening now. And it is absolutely vital that we, we do everything we can to reduce our emissions. But no matter what, this is the kind of level of, of, of disruption that we are already locked into. But and this is what I really want you to take away from my, my little uh, 10 minute slot. Who it is that is affected by this and where isn't the same for everywhere. And there's nothing natural about that. So if you take one thing away I want you to remember this message, and that is that there is no such thing as a natural disaster. Well, what do I mean by that? What do I mean by it when I say that there's no such thing as a, as a natural disaster? There are, of course, natural hazards, and so earthquakes are a natural hazard, um, tsunamis are a natural hazard. Things like landslides are natural, they're natural processes, but they're, you know, they're made stronger because of climate change, that's true. So, you know, that it is something in the natural environment. What turns that into a disaster is how it affects people. And who's affected most and where can be a result of a whole range of different factors. So, for example, some of these can be biological. So we know, like I said, older people, when it's hot, and when it's very cold, will struggle to deal with those temperatures so well. That's you know a, a biological, physical fact. If you have a situation like a flood where you have to maybe evacuate, that's much harder for people who have mobility uh, challenges to, to do. But also, some of these differences can be due to uh, our status and our place within society. So if you're not so wealthy, you perhaps can't afford air conditioning, that's a bigger issue in, in, in places like Asia, you know, you potentially can't afford to have the, the same level of protection that that, um, that wealthier households might have. Even at a neighbourhood level, we've got good evidence that uh, less well-off neighbourhoods, more deprived neighbourhoods might have less green coverage or less 
good quality parks and things that can soak up the rainwater and uh, and mitigate the heat. So there's nothing natural about who it is that is affected by a um, by by a hazard. And this is what I mean when I say there's no such thing as a natural disaster. And that's why this this idea of um, of resilience is, is so important. So when we, when we talk about a system that's resilient, we can mean a number of things. When we talk about something being resilient, we can mean being able to respond to shocks and stresses, being able to continue to function, being able to either bounce back or increasingly, as we say now, bounce forward and, and transform so that the next time something happens, the next time we face a shock or a setback, as a society, as a community, as individuals, we're, we're able to cope better. So resilient infrastructure, resilient societies are ones that are able to deal with the kind of shocks that you might get from floods, the kind of shocks you might get from heat waves, from landslides, from storms, from winds, and all the rest. But we've got to be a bit careful about that. We've got to be a bit careful how we use this this word and this uh, this phrase um, for for resilience, because if you just keep telling people to be more resilient, you're setting them up to have to prepare for more pressures, for more things that might be coming ahead. It's it's, it's absolutely vital that as well as, as as making people better able to cope, and as well as trying to reduce the harm that people have, we think about well, who is it that's responsible? for making sure that we don't get these disasters, we don't have the effects of these hazards in the in, in the first place. And that's all about thinking about how we, we you know, what it is that makes some people more risk versus um, things like income, things like social welfare. How do we address these underlying causes? That, that's, that's, that's absolutely vital and that has to come in, in the background when we talk about resilience. And actually, something that that that, uh, that is absolutely critical, and this is where hopefully you all, as students, come in, is that making the UK resilient doesn't just happen by magic. We don't just get a uh, we don't just get a resilient society through nothing. It requires people with jobs and skills to change our physical environment and also ensure that the people who are most vulnerable are not at further risk. And so again, I've, I've said this in the context of Scotland, but it's it's relevant for, for all of the UK as well. You know, we need the people now, the professionals now, who can deal with the climate change impacts we're already locked into over the next 10, 20 years. Some of those jobs will be things like building flood defences, shoring up our railways, you know, some of that will be civil engineering, it will be built environment engineering, it will be making our, our roofs stronger, making our buildings watertight. But also, a lot of that is, for instance, environmental planning. So we need people who can plan how to manage uh, floodplains, we need people who can plan how to manage transport networks, we need people who have those kind of skills too. We need people who know how to manage um, trees, forests, and nature so that they can soak up the rainfall and, and, and stabilise the hillsides. And also building on what Kevin said, we need systems thinkers. We need people who have, you know, maybe more creative approaches, who can think about how to, you know, energise action in their own communities to understand who's at risk and to understand what the, the opportunities are. We need people who know their locality and, you know, and how to think about how we can create good um, sustainable jobs locally and that that need that needs the arts and the humanities and culture just as much as it needs the the physical and natural sciences so i'm just going to stop there and i'm going to say you know there is no such thing as a natural disaster it depends on this kind of society we live in it depends on the kind of policies we have it depends on how our society and our culture is structured and organized that influences who's most at risk and who isn't under a climate emergency. If you remember that, I'll be, I'll be very happy. Um, so there's no such thing as a natural disaster. Green skills are making for vital for making Scotland and, and the wider UK resilient and for supporting the most vulnerable. I will stop there. Thank you very much. And I'll be very happy to take any questions that you might have.
Fabulous. Thank you so much, Ladley. Um, a really interesting presentation and definitely motivation to keep going with our degrees and finish those TMAs um, that we're currently sat here avoiding. <laughs> um, but we've already got some questions within in and do keep them coming because we've got a little bit of time left for questions, which is fantastic. Um, so Livia has asked, do you see a pattern in the type of housing affected by flooding? In short, yes, that's exactly right. We definitely see that. Um, we see that, as I say, it there is a a, a trend that you, that um, housing that is either local authority housing or privately rented housing tends to be at more risk from weather extremes. So my own my own expertise is hot weather; it's heat rather than than flooding. But this is absolutely true. For, for heat as well and there's a reason for that um so as i say hot weather um tends to be mitigated we have less the, the the actual within a city it's cooler when you've got more trees and more parks because that provides shading it can help the wind flow um it, it, it tends to be cooler places that have more trees and more parks tend to be more well off and that happens for a couple of reasons one, because when you plant things like that, rich people want to move in, the property prices go up. Two, because when you have a neighbourhood where people are maybe wealthier and more empowered, they're kind of able to organise, they know how to lobby the council to stop things being chopped down, to stop things being built in their parks and things. So again, that's exactly what we mean when we say there's no such thing as a natural disaster. There is really good evidence for all kinds of hazards that less well-off people, less empowered people tend to be disproportionately at risk under a change in climate and from disasters and hazards. Thank you so much for that. Questions are absolutely rolling in now, which is fantastic. So Erin would like to know if geography and environment are good subjects to be studying to get a future job um, within being resilient towards climate change. I'm going to say this because my own degree is in geography, but yes, absolutely. These are these are absolutely the kind of the kind of subjects that are are really useful because of the kind of building uh, the, the sort of knowledge and the context that you're going to get. But what I want to say as well is every job in future, in some ways, is going to be a climate change job. So climate change is going to affect every kind of job. So there are some jobs that will have climate change or environment in the titles, you know, like Glasgow City Council has got climate change and resilience officers. But some some jobs will will be created because of climate change or some new areas where we need we need new jobs. There's some kinds of jobs that might might disappear, things like drilling for oil and gas. And that's why it's really important. I put the word just transition in there. That means, you know, how we make new jobs for those people you know, whose livelihoods depend on things that we might stop doing. But a lot of jobs will transform because of climate change. Um, so absolutely every job is going to be a climate change job. Geography and environmental subjects are great for the kind of systemic thinking that Kevin was talking about and for getting that background picture of what's going on and what we need to do to respond. Amazing. I think Erin might be on that pathway herself because um, we got a massive smiley face through <laughs> in reaction to that, which is great. And um, there's some discussion going on about um, kind of buildings from further back in time. So Kevin noted that when was the last time a, a cathedral or town church in the UK was flooded? And it's prompted a little bit of discussion in the chat. I actually don't know the answer to that. I'm going to have to go away. And uh, I'm going to have to go away and look that up. Although I suspect Kevin knows the answer. He's probably going to tell me next time we have a meeting. But I'm going to have to go away and look that up because I'm really interested. But what I will what I will say about that is, again, that if we look at history, we can see that, OK, climate change is new, but there's actually a lot we can learn about how we built the environment and where we put important places in the past. So Japan, which is a country I know really well, if you look at where some of the shrines are, are built, very old Shinto shrines from 400, 500 years ago might look quite far in land, but they'll have place names that will be to do with waves. So, you know, in the past, a tsunami comes, they'll build a shrine or something, and it serves as a marker for future generations. You know, and kind of through culture, through spiritual practices, 
you can understand you know where the hazards are coming in the environment so that's really interesting to think you know if we look to history we look to the past we can learn a lot about what might be coming ahead absolutely and uh, we've got even more conversation going on around that that's uh, prompted a really good amount of discussion in the chat lots of comments coming through as well saying how interesting this is and thought provoking and um, particularly the not a natural disaster quote um, has been really thought provoking for sam and um, so lots and lots of interest in this and it's been a fantastic um interesting talk to oh talk to um, draw us to a close this evening um, again if there's any questions um, beyond this talk do please reach out to us um, because we'd love to be able to pass them on uh, but thank you so much Leslie um, for this evening your talk was absolutely incredible and um, thank you for taking questions as well it's really really appreciated thank you thank you super so we are towards the end of the evening thank you so much to all of the students who have been here with us throughout um, thank you for taking the time this evening to attend this event um, and take that little bit of time away from your studies we know how busy life is as an OU student and we always um, love being in a session together with all these fantastic questions and talks it's been a fantastic opportunity i just want to say a massive thank you to every single one of our speakers this evening we are so privileged um, to have had four very interesting and amazing talks um, for four of our incredible academics so thank you so much um, for giving up your time for us this evening um, and i know from the chat everybody is having a fantastic evening and has been amazed by all of the talks so much positive feedback coming through for all of you and um, so thank you so much um, and from the students association we'd just like to say keep an eye on the freshers website um, for our feedback survey and there's lots of competitions with prizes on offer we love prizes at the students association um, and we've also got, very sadly for me, um, the student elections will be coming up very soon. Um, so if you are interested in taking my role, because um, I am standing down um, this summer, um, and you're interested in taking the lead in your students association, it's a fantastic opportunity. You get to lead panels like this. Um, and get involved with so many things, university side as well as at the association. It is a brilliant opportunity, um, fits around your studies um, and is quite flexible too. So those times when I've been away on field work, I've managed to kind of shelve my role a little bit. So um, definitely something to look into. And you can reach us on our website, on various social media, we're on Twitter or X, whatever we're calling it now, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and there is a newsletter you can sign up to to find out more about events just like this one and our fantastic online magazine, The Hoot. So do check out our website, OUstudents.com, um, for all those incredible opportunities. Um, but thank you so, so much for joining tonight. It's been an absolute pleasure. Once again, thank you to all our speakers and have a fantastic evening. Best of luck with your studies. <laughs>